This is episode 23 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A.J. Johnson. Only two more to go after this one. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. If you've gotten this far, I hope you're enjoying it, so please take a minute to tell a friend. If you've done that, please consider leaving this podcast a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks. This podcast may contain fleeting explicit language, but honestly, I don't remember. I think there's maybe a dam or something in there. Chapter 56, Beginning of the End, Fall, 2016. Eric's sneakers padded along the trail. The tree's leaves had just started to turn and the squirrels bounded across the lawn searching for acorns. He looked at the landscaper shoveling mulch around the trees, the cars inching along the road that skirted the park, and the other joggers. But we are approaching energy independence, which decreases the need for military intervention in the Middle East, said upon its voice on Eric's favorite hour of his favorite national public radio show. So far, the guests had discussed domestic energy policy, the ups and downs of the economy, and the presidential race. Although he was deeply interested in politics and world affairs, all he could think about was how different the world would be in a week. The lives of everybody across the country would be permanently and irrevocably changed over the next seven days. Or at least he hoped so, if everything went according to plan. If they're able to broadcast next week, the weekly rundown will be completely different. He was enjoying his last run before he had to get going. So much was left to be done, but if he couldn't find time to do the things he enjoyed, what was it all for? Most of his books, tools, and personal effects had already been moved, and he and his wife had just a few remaining weatherproofing tasks to finish on their house before they left. It would be easier if they knew when they would be back, but it all depended on what happened next. And if everything went pear-shaped, he reminded himself, at least the house could be sold to raise money for the legal defense team they'd be needing. He had spent the last two years traveling, organizing, training, and planning, with everything leading up to this next week. He drove and flew more during this time than he ever had before in his life. He savored flying, even the tedious security measures, crammed spaces, and the diminished amenities, because he knew that he would be telling his children what it was like to fly. By then, commercial airplanes would be long gone. As he ran through the park, he gazed up at the canopy of well-kept trees and marveled at their efficiency, their leaves turning solar radiation into sugars at a rate comparable to the best commercially available solar panels. He had grown up in a heavily forested area, and had always felt that he was part of a larger ecosystem. After living in cities, he could understand why so many people saw themselves as separate from nature. He knew this was an artificial division, invented in cities and sustained through an industrial system that saw the world as a giant pile of resources just waiting to be used. Sure, he had doubts. The biggest worry of the entire organization had been discussed so often that it was referred to as the gamble. Namely, would society at large react proactively when the entire industrial infrastructure crashed around them? The majority, which included Eric, felt that At times of crisis, most people would pull together and the antisocial types would isolate themselves to their own detriment. That's what these folks wanted, after all. The group's greatest worry was that fear would take over and the antisocials would pick up arms and create feudal states a la Mad Max. They didn't want to trust this transition to chance, though, so even the naysayers thought that their Trojan horse network was up to the task. While the antisocials hunkered down, key people in communities across the country would spring into action and help shepherd mass hysteria into a rapid, coordinated response. The key was getting people to accept that the industrial way of life was over and a more modest subsistence was their best chance of survival. Eric, like most of the group, had gone through the Kubler-Ross stages of emotion as he learned more about the inevitable collapse of the industrial world. Even though he understood the scientific consensus on climate, He didn't really think it could happen. This was followed by weeks of anger at previous generations for their wastefulness, his contemporaries for their willful ignorance, and his lot for being around for the collapse. He was stuck on the bargaining stage for much longer, hoping that scientific breakthroughs would save us. Carbon sequestration, another green revolution in agriculture, biofuels, and so on. Eventually he realized that even if technology could reroute the course of history, The powers that be, namely fossil fuel and corporate interests, would not allow this to happen. This was followed by a long period of depression. Finally, once he had accepted the inevitable, Eric started to devise a plan. He had met a few others whom he had jokingly referred to as awakened to the truth. This was an ironic euphemism somebody started. It sounded like the hackneyed phrase a cult member would say, but it really was stolen from Buddhism, where adherents focused on understanding the truth, as realized by the Buddha, and the countless others who have gotten it. Each person in the gorillas remembers when the truth became clear. This realization sent many of them into a depressive spiral like the one experienced by Eric. They started writing the manifesto as a cathartic exercise, but all it did was solidify their beliefs and their need to do something. They also found that the arguments were persuasive enough that it sped people through the stages of grief and on to acceptance. It helped to be surrounded by a community of like-minded individuals. 
Some of the original members had felt like they were hiding a secret from their friends and families because they were afraid of being considered a so-called nut or radical. Now, thought Eric, let's see if we can help everybody accept the collapse of the industrialized world and get on with life. End of chapter. Chapter 57. Nuclear Scare Continues. Fall 2016. Headline. Used nuclear fuel containers found outside Dallas-Fort Worth. September 7, 2016. Dallas, Wired News Agency. After national attention on the nuclear storage containers found near Chicago, residents in the Dallas-Fort Worth area recognized similar containers near Lake Fort Worth, one source of Fort Worth's drinking water. Canoeists reported seeing a large metal container on Willow Island, a small spit of land in the middle of Lake Worth. Patsy and John Lucas have picnicked on the undeveloped island for years. In mid-August, they spent an afternoon on the island and noticed a large metal cylinder stuck in the mud on the southern, marshy side. When news of the spent nuclear fuel containers, known as multipurpose containers or MPCs, went national at the end of August, the couple recognized what they had seen on Willow Island. We couldn't believe it, said Patsy Lucas in a recent interview. We've been going to this island each summer. It isn't very big or pretty, but it's quiet and a nice place to relax. You can't get there without a boat, so nobody ever gets over there. After lunch, we walked around, and as we got to the swamp, we saw this big metal thing buried in the mud. We didn't think much of it, because the water level changes each year, but we saw those things in Chicago. They looked just the same, so we called the police. It is unclear at this time where the container originated, but initial reports from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission inspectors suggest that no nuclear fuel or contamination is present. This is especially important as Lake Worth forms part of the drinking water supply for the metro area. Comanche Peak Nuclear Power Plant is located approximately 60 miles southwest of Fort Worth. At this time, investigators have released no evidence linking the power plant to the MPC, but a spokesperson for the Comanche Peak's operating company, TEX Operations, has emphatically denied that any of the plant's containers or fuel have been inappropriately disposed of. Headline, Panic in New York as used nuclear fuel containers found near water supply. September 10, 2016. New York, Wired News Agency. On September 8th, one day after a spent fuel storage container was found in a Colorado River reservoir, and two months after three were found in the Chicago area, two multipurpose containers, MPCs, were found at the edge of the Rondout Reservoir, through which half of New York City's drinking water flows. The closest nuclear generating station is Indian Point, 40 miles to the southeast. City leaders were quick to label this as a hoax intended to frighten New Yorkers. It makes no sense for a nuclear facility to illegally dump MPCs in a reservoir said Mayor Bill de Blasio at a press conference in the morning of the 9th. He continued, If somebody wanted to dump these illegally, and I do mean if, wouldn't they put them somewhere less conspicuous? This is clearly meant to induce panic in the public. I consider this an act of terrorism. If we panic, that will be just what they want. Go about your business. Stay calm. Drink the water. At this point, the mayor stopped to take a drink from a glass. We always monitor the water quality and have stepped up our screening for anything radioactive out of an abundance of caution. Let me stress this point. We have no reason to believe any radioactive materials entered our waterway. But to err on the side of caution, we have increased our monitoring efforts. When photos surfaced on social media of an aide filling Mayor de Blasio's water or glass with bottled water before the conference, public sentiment turned against the officials. Although New Yorkers are all too familiar with acts of terrorism, and while the usual public response typically ranges from solidarity to stubborn adherence to daily routines, in this case the public appears to have lost faith in its city's leaders and water supply. Since this morning, Bottled water is difficult to find, and consumers are reporting price gouging in stores. Employers are beginning to report workers calling in sick, requesting time off, or failing to show up. Headline, Nuclear Fuel Container Found in LA's Water Supply. September 12, 2016. Los Angeles, Wired News Agency. Just days after nuclear fuel canisters were found in the areas surrounding the water supplies for Dallas-Fort Worth and New York City, a similar multipurpose container, MPC, was found in a reservoir that feeds the California aqueduct system, which provides drinking water to the Los Angeles area. A beginner scuba class at the Buena Vista Aquatic Recreation Area, 10 miles southwest of Bakersfield, California, identified a large cylinder under the water. The reservoir feeds into the California aqueduct system and is lower than usual due to the prolonged drought in California. The instructor of the class stated that she had been using this area for lessons for years, but had never seen the water so low. I don't remember seeing it there before, but I don't usually get down that far with a beginner's class, she said. It looked like those containers I saw out in the news in Chicago, so I called it in. Officials responded with divers and hoisted the container out of the reservoir. The operation took place within a few hundred yards of a public campsite and picnic area, and while the officials have yet to confirm that the cylinder was an MPC, photos from the onlookers clearly show the size, shape, and markings of containers used to hold spent nuclear fuel. 
The closest nuclear facility to the Buena Vista Aquatic Recreational Area is the Diablo Canyon Power Plant just south of St. Louis Obispo, 120 miles away. Officials for the power plant have not responded to requests for information in the 24 hours since the canister was discovered. In the days and weeks following the discovery of MPCs in Chicago, New York, and Dallas, fear has gripped the public. Chicago officials estimate that approximately 10% of the city's population has left in the three weeks since the canister was found on a public beach, just miles from the city's water intake. Mayor Rahm Emanuel addressed this issue in a recent press conference. It started as a trickle, but we're seeing a major uptick in people leaving since more canisters were found outside of other cities. Those leaving the cities often cite a lack of confidence in city and government officials to safeguard public health. In New York, Mayor de Blasio exhorted the public to trust the water supply while drinking a glass of water to reinforce his point, but pictures of his aides filling his glass with bottled water went viral on social media. Although only a few days have passed, New York is already reporting that many employers are granting their employees extended leaves of absence. End of chapter. Chapter 58. Late Night in Tennessee. Fall 2016. Josh and Jillian drove down the road on the way to their rendezvous spot. They hadn't seen another car for what seemed like hours. Just after they crossed the Tennessee state line, bright red and blue flashing lights appeared behind them as the state trooper pulled onto the highway from his hiding spot. Damn it, said Josh, as he gripped the steering wheel until his knuckles turned white. He let out a breath and glanced over at Jillian. Let's just hope this guy plays it straight. Grab the registration and insurance card. As she reached into the glove compartment to retrieve the documents, Josh started running back through the training exercises in his mind. He had removed the eco-slogan bumper stickers from the back of his truck, but the bed was full of gear. Gas cans, camping equipment, food, supplies, radios, and the crew's entire store of C4, hidden in a bag of dog food. All of it was locked under a hardtop bed cover. The cab was completely empty except for a few empty chip bags and water bottles. Hey, smile, you're on candid camera, said Jillian as she started her phone recording. She propped it in the cup holder facing Josh in his window. I'm texting Eva to let her know where we are and what's happening. Tell her to call if she doesn't hear the all clear in 20 minutes. By this time, they had pulled over the side of the highway and turned off the truck. The trooper had stopped behind them. His cruiser was staggered out on the driver's side to protect the officer and shine brights into the mirrors of the truck. Josh could see the trooper's silhouette as he exited the vehicle and put on his Stetson. Josh rolled down his window, but only a quarter of the way and kept his hands on the wheel as the trooper walked towards his door. Evening. License, registration, and proof of insurance, please. I'm going to pick them up off my dash here, sir, said Josh as he slowly reached for them and passed them out the window. The trooper looked them over. Do you know why I pulled you over? No, sir, said Josh, turning his head toward the trooper, careful to keep his expression neutral as his heart thumped in his chest after scanning the badge and nameplate added Trooper Hendrickson. Hendrickson looked nonplussed at this and flicked a toothpick from one side of his mouth to the other. Do you know how fast you're going? I can't tell you that, sir. Did you know the speed limit change as you crossed into Tennessee? I can't tell you that, sir. Okay, you're telling me that you don't know how fast you're going and that you don't know the speed limit, is that right? No, sir. I'm respectfully refusing to answer your question, sir, as protected by the Fifth Amendment. Henderson rolled his eyes at this. Yeah, fine, so you've seen an internet video of how to annoy cops. I'm going to go run your license. Please do not move or start your vehicle. He walked back to his cruiser, looking over the covered truck bed on the way. Josh and Jillian exchanged glances. What do you think? asked Josh after a pause. We can't be searched. We'd have to risk running if he tries to search us. I wish we knew our way around here because we'll only have a minute to get off the road and hidden before he catches up to us. This old rust bucket will never outrun him. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. Oh, here he comes. The trooper approached Josh's window again. All right, here are your license and papers. I want to do a visual inspection of your vehicle and its contents. Can you step out of the vehicle, please? Respectfully, sir, the bed of the cover is locked. My glove compartment is locked. My doors are locked. The cab's empty and my hands are visible. May I please see your warrant to search my property, as I do not consent to a search? Hendrickson spit out his toothpick. Son, I'm asking you to step out of the vehicle. Sir, with respect, are you detaining me? Please get out now. Don't make me call this in. Sir, am I being detained, or am I free to go? Ma'am, said Hendrickson, trying a different tactic. Is everything okay? You look worried. Are we free to go, sir? Jillian asked him. I want to look around your vehicle. I'm asking you for the last time to step out. Sir, if I'm not being detained, I'm going to start my vehicle and continue on my way. Am I being detained? Hendrickson's jaw muscles clenched. Here's a ticket for speeding. I had you clocked at 73 and the speed limit on the interstates is 70. You can appeal this charge at the court date and time listed on the ticket. You can also pay the ticket by mail. And a word of advice, don't be cute with us. Now get the hell out of here. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, Josh said, taking the ticket and rolling up his window. After the trooper had walked back to his cruiser and driven away, he let out a long breath. Check the court date. A month from now. 
We'll either be in jail or on the run, possibly dead or helping everyone adjust to the new normal. Let's hope we don't see that guy later in the week. I don't think he's going to take it well, Josh said through a smirk. You can say that again, said Jillian, smiling as Josh started up the truck. End of chapter. Chapter 59. Emptying Cities. Fall 2016. Headline. Fourth nuclear fuel caster found in Chicago area. Panic ensues. September 13th, 2016. Chicago. Wired News Agency. A fourth nuclear fuel container has been found in the Chicago area. In the last week, multipurpose containers used to house spent nuclear fuel, now widely known as MPCs, were found in the water supplies of Fort Worth, New York, and Los Angeles. This followed weeks of national coverage of the first three MPCs found in Chicago and in the subsequent investigation. The fourth MPC was found yesterday near Foster Beach, where the third container had been found two weeks ago. Unlike the previous canister, which had been found exposed in the beach sand after a storm, this MPC was underwater about 100 feet east of the beach. This container was located by a drone pilot who was making a short video about the location of the other MPC. Brett Marcus was flying his camera-enabled drone over Lake Michigan to show the relative distance between the beach and the Deaver Street water crib about four miles to the southeast, when he noticed a large shape in a shot of the water below the drone. The day was unusually calm, which is why Mr. Marcus had chosen to make his video at that time. The drone can take high wind, but I didn't want to risk it over the water, said Mr. Marcus, when reached for comment. It was really clear yesterday, so I flew it out a ways and started to climb in order to get a shot of the Deaver Street water crib and Foster Beach. As I took the drone higher, I pointed the camera down and saw this big rectangle below me. I wasn't sure how big it was, but it seemed worth checking out, so I waded in and saw this big cylinder. Authorities responded quickly. After it was determined that this canister was also empty and not a radioactive danger, investigators scoured the area for clues. The lid and securing bolts were found a few feet away from the canister, but no other information was made available. The MPC was removed from the water and taken away for further examination. The removal of the canister was witnessed by a growing crowd on the beach. Local residents and the media descended on Foster Beach as soon as the news broke that another MPC had been found. Although the public did not seem to fear radiation from the site itself, many in the crowd expressed concern about their drinking water after the mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio, was seen drinking water that he claimed was from the city's taps, but was later revealed to be bottled water. Since the news broke yesterday morning, city officials and prominent businesses have reported a record number of employees asking for extended leave or simply failing to appear for work. Traffic in outbound lanes has been steadily increasing. Although unscientific and anecdotal, posts on social media suggest that many people are taking extended vacations to visit relatives in areas thought to be unaffected by potentially contaminated water. Yesterday evening during a press conference, James Eberwine, a spokesperson for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, suggested that the MPCs found across the country were a part of a coordinated terrorist plot. It makes no sense to me why nuclear facilities would dump empty containers in prominent locations. MPCs are easy to get rid of when they are empty. And I want to stress that all evidence suggests that these containers were empty when they were deposited. So why dump them illegally? Furthermore, why in drinking water reservoirs? This looks to me like a terrorist group attempting to induce panic, and I'd hate to see them succeed. Mr. Aberwine continued, exhorting the residents of Chicago, Dallas-Fort Worth, New York, and Los Angeles to stay calm, remain in their cities, and trust the local officials. End of chapter. End of episode 23 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com.